Him. Let's head over to Matthew chapter 7 as we get started. Matthew chapter 7. While you're turning there, let's just remind our, ourselves. And would somebody be so kind to turn the fans back a little bit so the people underneath don't get that draft? Here we go. Let's see how we wake up. We have Valentine's Day this week. So we're talking sweetie stuff, okay? Roses are red, violets are blue. What kind of flowers does a cheap guy give you? Dead ones? Dead ones. Whoa. Uh, you can't get worse than the dead ones. Yeah. From the cemetery. From the cemetery. It can get worse. It can get worse than dead flowers. You steal them from the dead people, Bob. Oh, my word. Wow. <laughs> Sounds familiar, doesn't it, Earl? <laughs> they didn't say from the cemetery. I mean, that's, woo, okay. Here's what they said. They said dandelions, okay. They said plastic or fake. They said tulips, none. That's where we're at, okay. <laughs> they said carnations and daisies was number one for cheap. Name a popular Valentine gift. You're right, me. <laughs> yeah, I saw you mouth that. <laughs> What'd you say? Candy? What'd you say? Jewelry, candy, dinner out, card. Okay, there you go. Popular Valentine gift, perfume, supper out, jewelry. This is so sweet. Roses, candy, flowers, chocolates was number one. Besides darling, what are some of the common terms of endearment used by couples? Honey, sweetheart, sweetie. Here's what the survey said. Baby, love, dear, sweetie, sweetheart, honey. Number one. Hey, hey. <laughs> Name people who traditionally get Valentine's cards. Mother, kids. Uh, who, who get them? They get them from students, let's say. Okay. Teachers get them. Spouses. Grandparents. Okay. Here's what they said. Teachers, classmates, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, grandkids, and the last one was pastors. <laughs> How much did the average American spend on Valentine gifts last year? Okay, too much. <laughs> <laughs> you probably get flowers out of the graves, graveyard too, right? <laughs> okay. What do you think it is? Zero? <laughs> 50 bucks? 100 to 200? 192 dollars. We are way below average. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Name places couples love to go out together. Dinner, restaurant, movies. What'd you say? <laughs> the Trump rally in Harrisburg. <laughs> Here we go. Picnic, beach, favorite vacation spot, mall, stores, movies, restaurant. Number one, church. They go out. Everyone loves to go to church together on a hot date. So you're here. We're ready to talk about hot date and you don't judge your spouse. Why do we do that? Why do we say it? Because Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is speaking in this text, and he's in the latter half of the Sermon on the Mount. And as he's speaking, judge not that you be not judged, chapter 7. <clears throat> For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why do you behold the mote that is in your brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in your own eye? Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out that mote out of your eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye? <clears throat> you hypocrite, 
First cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to be able to cast out the mote out of your brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Jump over a few more verses. Uh, well, let's go down to verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come unto you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Okay? And then verse 17, even so every good tree brings forth what kind of fruit? Good fruit. Every corrupt tree brings forth what? The evil fruit. And he goes on and on. He says, verse 20, again, by their fruits you shall know them. So what we've concluded is this. Jesus did say, <clears throat> this is a truism, that judge that you be not judged. But we've pointed out in the last three, four weeks, <clears throat> this is not a prohibition. This is not a statement saying, don't ever use discernment, don't ever evaluate anything, don't ever make <clears throat> some type of, of uh, uh, practical judgment. And we know that's true because he even talks about the idea of, hey, before you judge somebody else and get the beam out of their eye, God, take care of your own. So he's, he's allowing, in that very same paragraph, he's allowing for you to deal with somebody else having an issue, but you first have to deal with your own issue. Okay. He talks about you have to make an assessment about spiritual dogs, the swine. You have to be aware of false prophets. you got to use some discernment. This isn't a passage prohibiting any type of discerning, but what he is prohibiting is the idea of judging improperly, which in this text he makes it very clear how we would judge wrongly, and he uses an exaggerated illustration that it is wrong to judge somebody else if you yourself have greater issues, you yourself are, you know, attacking somebody for using some type of improper word, but you tell the dirty stories, you're, uh, t you know, so much worse in it. And so the idea is don't be quick to judge others when you're doing some of the same things yourself. And we gave illustration last week about how so quick this happens. We can be critical of somebody blowing off steam at work or a co-worker, but then we go home and do the same thing to our kids. We use the illustration. We can criticize the government, and rightfully so. Does the government spend too much money? Are they out of control? Yeah, yeah, we understand that. But then, if we're going to criticize them, make sure we're not standing on some soapbox, and our soapbox is just filled with all kinds of credit card expenses, and we're way beyond what we should be doing. Uh, we get upset with our spouse being negative and unappreciative, but then <clears throat> you aren't quick to compliment. You're very critical of other people around you. Uh, we talked about the idea of scolding your child for being unkind, but you gossip about people. You say things that are inappropriate. We talked about politicians not keeping their word, but then we don't do that when it comes to our kids, our family, our spouse, our, our church family. And so there's lots of those illustrations that we can say, wow, these corporations, they're so greedy, they take when they shouldn't take. But then you steal from the employer or you're fo not following copyright laws. So that idea of if we're going to judge, let's not be hypocritical. Quick to judge others, but we're doing the same thing. And he uses the word, you know, be not a hypocrite. When he says, don't judge others while you have a beam in your own eye. Well, he's already in this passage talked about people who are hypocritical. Don't pray as the hypocrites. Who were the hypocrites he was talking about in that passage? The Pharisees, because they would go out and pray in public, but there was nothing in essence in there. Well, when it comes to judging, you made observation last week that the Pharisees were very guilty. And we, used, we looked at a text. We looked at the uh, prodigal son, the older brother, being the Pharisaical one. The quick to judge, the hypocritically judging without mercy, using themselves as a standard that you have to live up to what I am, otherwise you're wrong. And we made another observation. They don't judge themselves. The Pharisees were very typical of this. They would stand in the, in the temple and they would say, I thank you, God, I am not like that. And so we don't want to be hypocritical. We don't want to be like Pharisaical. And so we were paused last week at this spot where we were saying one of the things we don't want to do if we don't want to be Pharisaical is when we are making assessments and judgments which are appropriate to do at times, but we want to do them the right way. As Jesus said, judge righteous judgment. 
<clears throat> so we want to make sure that we do it with the spirit of humility, not arrogance, not superiority. And when we were discussing this last week, we made these observations. We avoid elevating or assuming the best about ourselves and the worst about others. Okay, we, we just have to be so cautious because that's one of those hypocritical uh, ways of being, being very pompous and arrogant. We do not establish ourselves as a standard for everybody else to follow. The, sta the idea here was we recognize some basic truths, and this is where we pause talking about some basic truths that we need to be careful of. And we made some, and you added, and so I've added some more up here from where we were last week. We need to remember basic truth. Sin distorts how we view, you know, even our own faults. We can easily get blinded to where we're struggling. Sin does that to us. I'm not so bad. We need to be quick to, we are, because of our sin nature, we're quick to find faults in others while not seeing our own faults. That's implied in this passage. We've got to be careful of that. We've got to be careful of exaggerating other people's faults while we minimize our own. You know, that guy, that guy. Just, I, I just saw this guy driving down the street when I, came, when I came up here to the T. This guy came flying down Oak Street. He had to be going 60 miles an hour in the 35. Terrible. But we minimize, you know, when we turn the corner and go down the street, we minimize how we tailgate the next guy. But we exaggerate what the way they were driving while we minimize our flaws. And we want, to, we want immediate grace to be extended to us. But the Pharisees, they didn't extend much grace to many others. But they would have demanded it for themselves. Some things you said, we trend away from putting ourselves in other people's shoes. But we expect them that they give us a break and put themselves in our shoes when it goes the other way around. As was stated, we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions. That, well, this is what I meant to say. But we judge others and we give them no break for their intentions. We judge them by their actions. So we got to be very, very careful. The writer of the book, uh, and I had the last one I had given you last week, we're courageous in fronting sin and others, but we're not real courageous in confessing. Fessing up, going to people we've offended. But we demand, we have courage to confront. But we have a struggle with saying, I was really wrong in what I did or what I said. But I'm courageous to say, you were wrong. You know, you bo that bothered me. And so dealing with that, the author of the book that I've been working with, he says this, eye surgery, talking about this text, eye surgery is most delicate. A blind ophthalmologist cannot possibly remove the speck out of another person's eye. Christ's point, we have no right to judge others until we have been willing to admit the truth about ourselves. Perhaps one of the greatest problems in our churches is that we do not mourn over our own personal sin. We sin without brokenness, without a full recognition of our wrongs in God's presence. We think our sin is superficial, so we deal with it superficially. He concluded, only after we have the courage to see our own sins and selves as God sees us, will we be able to judge others properly. My friend, that is a mouthful. That is where all of us are, have to work at on a daily basis to have that humility before the Lord, to make sure that when we do wrong, we confess it, we don't excuse it, we don't hide it, we don't try to pretend, but then we are quick to correct other people. Can't do that. Can't do that. And so we've got to be very, very careful. The more humble we are before the God in the sense of confessing and acknowledging our own struggles, the more discerning and merciful we will be with other people. So let's move on to something else. Not only do we need to have a spirit of humility, not superiority. Number two, we need to focus on facts, not presumptions. Is this a struggle? Do some people jump to conclusions very quickly? Yes? Okay. Here's, here's the idea. Uh, the observations. Those of us who are quick to make judgments often don't need much evidence to be critical. I think that's a truism for us, okay? 
Let's do a little bit. It is very easy for us to make a skewered judgment when we hear only one side of the story. True? Okay. If you're dealing with people, let's say some friends of yours come and they are having marital issues and they're coming. It is very easy to become very convinced if you're only listening to the one partner. Right? Because the one partner, if we understand our sin nature, what, and what we talked about already, if you're only hearing my side of the story, what is my sinful tendency in what I tell? I'm going to exaggerate her faults and minimize my own. That's sin nature. And how, how many of us struggle with that? Okay, we all do. And so you need to recognize that, wait a minute, I need to hear both sides of the story. Might him or her, the one party, be really, really, you know, you know uh, guilty, you know, uh, predominantly? Yeah, but most of the times, most of the times when there's conflict, what would you say? It takes two. It takes two. And so we want to be very, very careful. This is my jab. Of the many who claim to have special intuition or the ability to read people's motives, and I hear this frequently, people say, well, I have this gift of being able to really, I can, I can sense if this person is genuine or not. And usually I hear that after somebody has stumbled into some grievous sin and and then their individual come up and said, well, I knew all along something was wrong. I could tell. You know, 2020 hindsight, our hindsight vision is always 2020. And so for those who claim to have this special ability that they can sense and they can see and, you know, they know so much more than the rest, the, the facts are they probably haven't been 100% right. There's probably been moments they've not been right. And so if you have this prophetic gift of God that you can evaluate people and you know their innermost senses and motives, if you claim to have this gift of prophecy or incitement, according to scriptures, how accurate do you have to be if it's really this gift of God? 100%. 100%. And so be very careful... Be very careful of claiming this spiritual insight to see into the souls of people. May, may I throw it out there? Who has that ability and who alone can see into the hearts of people? God. So don't play God. Don't play God in this one, okay, especially when judging. As humans, we all have limited knowledge. We don't know everything about anything or anyone. So there's a reality here. We have limited knowledge. Now, you and I run into people who they present themselves that they know everything. And usually it doesn't take you long to go, they don't. Okay. So be very cautious in this one, okay, when you're when dealing with facts and presumptions. In fact, the Word of God gives us warnings about this. We read in the book of Proverbs, he who answers a matter before he hears it He's brilliant. He's wonderful. What's the verse say? It's folly. It's foolishness. And it usually results in what? Shame. So hear the whole matter. Be very, very careful. There's another passage that, uh, that's in the New Testament that talks about. It. It's a passage of dealing with, with uh, the pastor. If the pastor is doing wrong. And it says, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of everyone that the rest may also fear. So when we're dealing with somebody who's, who's in the position, if you have to deal with me, uh, the idea is deal with it. Deal with it and just confront it and, yeah, deal with it in an open sense because, you know, you want to be able to, to follow the Word of God to say, hey, we need others to know that those in authority and position of leadership, they are, they are an example and if and if they're rebuked publicly, that'll send a message to the rest of the body. It's a good thing. But the previous verse is really, really insightful and challenging because can we find wrong in anybody? 
Can we find, can, could you, if you really worked hard at it, <laughs> find some flaw in what I do? If you really worked hard at it. And my wife's eyes are gone. <laughs> okay. Do you remember the previous verse, the warning here? Against an elder. Yeah, he says, against an elder, don't receive an, an, an accusation unless there's two or three witnesses. What is he warning them about? In this case of, in a church. What is he warning about? Yeah, you got to get enough evidence. Get the facts, don't make a presumption. Don't jump on the bandwagon of crucifying somebody or condemning somebody. That's what he's getting to. And so the whole idea here is you and I got to be very, very careful. And so if we're applying this and we're saying, okay, I want to hear the whole matter. I want to get the facts. I don't want to make a presumption or a conclusion too quickly. What is that? How does this apply to us? What do you have to do? If you're making a judgment, what does that tell you to do in the process? Anything? Any food for thought? You got to gather evidence. In order for you to gather evidence, what does that take? It takes time, right? Okay. How quickly can we assume something? Immediately, in an instance. As soon as we hear a little bit, we start making some assumptions. What is he warning us to do? Take more time to think it through. What does that say about your mouth? Okay, seriously. Okay, this, we're all in this boat together, by the way. Okay, we're all in this. this we all struggle with this. Okay, what it tells me is don't be hasty in making negative judgments. I can really make good negative judgments really fast, I can find flaws. Maybe a few of you are as adept at that. Okay. But hey, wait a minute. He's warning me, don't do that. Train yourself not to make or act upon quick assumptions. Don't be hasty in a response. As a parent, did you ever find yourself, or am I the only one in this room, ever found yourself reacting quickly and coming down on the kids without getting all the facts? Oh, Two or three of us have done this, okay? Where it's, I'm, they just, they did something that frustrated me, and it was just like, bring down, you know, the anvil, boink! And I didn't know all the, what was going on. And so, even as a parent, as a spouse, as relationships, take time to get the facts before you make a comment, you pass judgment, or you're critical. But if I'm talking to somebody and they're telling me things, I must agree with them because they're my friend. What, what would the Word of God caution you to do? Hear all of it. Okay, be very careful. Recognize getting the facts is not simply hearing and believing what another person has to say or think. They may not know all the facts, is that possible? They may be distorting it, but they're my friend. That's like saying everything you read on the internet is true. Okay? Just because it came out of the mouth of somebody you know, does that mean they're giving you all the facts? You gotta be careful. You gotta be careful. Okay? Best thing for you and I to do is to remain quiet at times. Just to hush. Be quiet. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, and don't say anything more at this moment. I don't know about you. That's hard. That's hard because I have the I have this American thinking that if something is said, I have to. I've got to comment on it. I mean. You know, if, if somebody's on, you know, commenting on Facebook and I read it, I've got to throw in my two cents. Do you need to throw in your two cents? No, no. So very, be very, very cautious in this one. Uh, presuming and uh, getting without the facts. Examine their words and actions, not their motives. 
This one's really tough. This one's really hard. Um, they, but, but this is exactly what the, hypocr- uh, the Pharisees did all the time. They would judge people's motives. In fact, there's a character in Scripture that he went after somebody's motives. And he said the only reason he does what is right is because, and he gave the wrong motives. Do you know who I'm talking about? We preached an entire series on it. The name began with J and ended with a B, and there was an O in the middle. Job. Yeah, job. Do you remember remember who accused him, his motives? What did Satan say? The only reason he serves you, God, because you give him good stuff. Take away the good stuff, he's going to curse you. He's a, he was accusing his motives. He wasn't, exam, he wasn't going by what was visible. He was going by the heart. But the Word of God says, who can know the heart? Oh, yeah, only God. Only God can know the heart. So we are told, now this is interesting, we are told in Scripture, we examine them by their fruits. What's the fruit? Actions, words, okay? Actions and words. Let me see if I can give an example of this, okay? The, I, we've already mentioned that, how Satan did that. In Second Peter, he's, he's giving a whole list. He's talking about false prophets. Do you remember in Second Peter what, how Peter, under the inspiration of Scripture, says typically you can, one of the characteristics of false prophets are their teaching false. <laughs> this is so, I'm, it sounds redundant. Okay. He, they're teaching false truths. But then he says their actions, there's two things that stand out about their actions. Anybody remember what they are? They're very, typically, they want money. They're, very, they're after a lot of money. And the other one has to do with their morality. It's usually kind of loose. Okay. So, I know that, you know that. That means if we're listening to a radio program, we're listening, seeing a TV program, and the preacher, he says, if you would like to contribute to our ministry, you can send $10 to Faith Baptist Church in care of Faith Baptist Church Ministries. And we will, you know, put it in, and it'll help us to continue this ministry. Because he asked for money, he's a huckster. Is that a fair assessment? No. No. Not at all. What are you supposed to examine? We're supposed to examine what are they teaching, what are they saying, primarily. Yes? Okay. And then are there some fruits? But just because we don't like preachers asking for money we assume everybody who does is a crook. And sometimes that happens because we came out of churches that what did they do all the time? They asked for money. And all of a sudden we assume anybody who does that is bad. Is that judging motives? Yeah, can we do that? The answer is no, you've got to be very, very careful. You've got to be very, very cautious in this idea of examining and assuming that this is what's motivating them. Be very careful in examining or challenging somebody's motives and trying to, re- again, right back to reading their heart. You've got to be very, very cautious with it. It's best to limit our judgments to what we can know. Now, this one is going to get us for a couple of weeks. This is going to take us into, into a real uh, touchy discussion. Okay, head over to the book of Romans. Let's go there. Let's head over to the book of Romans. What we are, we're going to head over to Romans 14. <clears throat> and we're going to deal with something here out of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 14 is going to be our story. While you're turning there, let me ask you three questions, okay? Think it through. Would you agree with this? Some things are always right. Like what? What is always right or right to do? Okay. 
Obeying God's word? Gravity is always there, yeah. What in, in lifestyle, in words, what is always right? Okay, praising God is always right. What's that? Kindness is always right. What's that? Purity is always right. Okay, okay. So we have these things. There's some things that as far as, remember, we're judging somebody by their fruit. Okay? So what is always some right things? It's going to be, you know, this type of stuff is going to be right. Okay? And, and again, I know you can nuance it and say, well, you know, if, and you can give me a conditional clause. But typically we're saying this is always right. It's a, are there some things that are always wrong? Blasphemy is always wrong. Lying is always wrong. Stealing? Stealing? Okay. So we would look and we would say, probably the thou shalt nots of the Ten Commandments tell you some things are always wrong, right? Do you, do you, have, do you remember any of the Ten Commandments that are always wrong? No other gods. Yeah. Okay. So we have a bunch of them. And we have some rights, okay, that, that would have been right in that, uh, that commandments. Okay. So let me take a step further. Would you agree that when he says the works of the flesh, he's saying this is wrong? This is something you want to avoid by calling it a work of the flesh. You'd agree with that? Okay. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, selfish drunkennesses, revelries, all that, 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 that. And he says those who are involved with this without any type of conviction or guilt, those people, that is typifying of them. If we judge them by their fruits, they are not what? They're not, they're not going to inherit the kingdom. They're not, what would you say? They're not saved. They're not saved. So this type of stuff, would you agree that 99 and 9 tenths of the time, that stuff's wrong? Yes? Okay. Let's take it a step further. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom? Don't be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, covetousness, drunkards, revilers. That type of practice, again, is always wrong. You do realize that in our culture, it is changing that, right? Our culture is saying, and the one that's really in our face right now of all of that is what? They're saying there's, that at times it's, it's okay. My contention based on the Word of God is, according to this text, it's always wrong, right? Okay, and, and again, we will... As the choir, we will say amen to the idea of homosexuality, but pick the one that we might hide. Covetousness. covetousness. My covetousness isn't as bad as somebody being gay. But according to this text, it's bad. Okay, it's bad. Okay, it's always wrong. Let's throw another passage up. And see if this, again, isn't saying certain things are always wrong. Um, right in the middle of it. Oh, yeah, the second line. Fornication and cleanness covered. Let it not be named. Put that in, in modern terminology. Yeah, it shouldn't even be discussed here. It shouldn't even be suggested. It should be so foreign to the Christian that it's not even implied that they're doing this. What are the stuffs? Uh, filthiness, foolish talking, coarse joking. Uh, they're not fitting, fornicating, unclean person, covetous, idolater, etc., etc. And again, you mentioned covetousness. Isn't it interesting? He brings that up more in these passages than homosexuality. Okay. But the point is, would you agree these texts are saying these things are always wrong? They shouldn't even be joked about. Okay, okay. So some things are always wrong, some things are always right. Now let's open up Pandora's box. Pandora's box for us is true or false. Some things become evil or good depending on the context or the impact they have on you or others or your motives. Is there at times situations that indicate some things become wrong, some things may change and become good at times. Like the eat or drink. 
How much, you said? I say what you, what do. you do. Okay. What you eat or drink. Okay. So you're really hesitant. You're not responding. Is this a truism that some things can be wrong? Or let me, let, let me make it really difficult. Okay. Challenging. If I said to you, it's okay for Jim to be covetous, but not Mike, how would you respond to that? It's okay for Jim to have an idol, but not Mike to have an idol. Okay, it's double standard. Okay? Is that wrong? Well, I'm talking about the evil covetousness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, uh, we did this in our class, and so I'm basing on, are there certain things we should desire that are good? Okay, so in the context of that covetousness, we're not talking about seeking first the kingdom of God. Okay, we're talking about the aspect of covetousness in the sense of wanting to have things that don't belong to you. Okay, and again, we talked about that on our Wednesdays uh, at length. Um, but I'm talking in general. Is it okay for him to steal, but it becomes wrong for him not to... Uh, yeah, well... <laughs> Okay, again, you guys can give me all kinds of nuances, okay? But keep with the big picture here, okay? Okay, to, to, let me be more, more silly with the illustration so that we don't... This guy can commit adultery, this, yeah, and it's okay, but if this guy does it, we're going to get after him. This guy can go out and be gay, but this guy ought not. No, we'd say that that would be double standards, okay? Okay, it's sin, always sin. Okay, now let me throw you this. For this guy to be watching TV, it's a problem and he shouldn't do it. For this guy, TV's not an issue. Can that be a truism? Yes. Yes. What's that? Well, it comes down to what he's watching and if it's controlling him. And we, now we nuance certain things. Okay? And in the Christian life, is there allowance in the Bible to nuance certain activities? We want everything black and white. Preacher, tell me if I should do this or if I shouldn't do it. We have churches that want to stand up and say, you need to wear a certain color of clothes and you need to have a tuft. Okay? Well, nobody says the tuft. Okay, I'll grant you that. Okay. But we have churches that say that. And is that comfortable for some people? Because they want to be told what to do. Okay. But is that the biblical approach to say, you do what I tell you to do? You wear what I tell you to wear. You drive the vehicles that I tell you to do. You sit down when I tell you to sit down. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jimmy. You just, so, you just played right into my hand there. Okay. Is, do you follow where I'm going with this? You said that it's in this text. You brought up the idea of what? what we eat, what we eat or drink. Is that true biblically that what we eat or drink depends, it can become good or bad depending upon the individual, depending upon the circumstances? True or false? Biblically speaking, okay, jump into the middle of it, Romans 14. Him that is weak in the faith, receive, but not to doubtful, dis doubtful disputations. For one believes that he may... What's your Bible read? Eat all things. Another, he says he can only eat what? Yeah, now there's where we have translations. Some of you have vegetables. Some of us have herbs. They, the, the word is the same. We're talking about somebody who is you know, sticking with vegetables. Okay? Not somebody saying garlic is the only thing you can eat. Okay. Um, let him that eats... Uh, let not him that eat despise the one that doesn't eat. Let not him that eats not judge the one that... I'm, I'm reading this. You get the point. Okay. Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. 
And he says, verse 5, he opens up another box, Pandora's box. One man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day are, there's no difference in the days. Let every man be what? Okay, so let's talk about this. In Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8, the issue that he specifically uses as an illustration, and it's not the end all, but it's an illustration, that people have a difference in the local church is the idea of eating meat. It is not instigated by vegetarianism or, you know, I'm a, I'm a meataholic. It is driven by their culture, this whole discussion. What was the culture that made people question eating meat? If it was sacrificed at the idols, to the idols. Because we all know they made meat sacrifices and they made vegetable sacrifices. Right? Did the Jews do that? The unsaved, the Gentiles, did the same thing. And we know historically that like in Corinth, the P, the, what would happen is, um, no, let me back up. Let me make sure we're all on the same page. For the Jews, if you sacrifice the meat, could the priests take part of the sacrifice and eat it? They were allowed to. Okay. Now, in the Gentile church, they did the same thing. The Gentile temple things. The priests would live off the offerings. But like in Corinth, they not only ate it, what did they do? Their meat market was on the back side of the temple. And so they were taking meat that was sacrificed to Aphrodite, you know, Apollos, and they were turning around and they were selling it at the meat market. And the question became, can I eat meat that three hours ago had been sacrificed to Apollo? If I eat that meat, I'm supporting the temple priests who are all corrupt. And some of the believers came to the conclusion, what? I shouldn't do it. Okay. Was Paul one of those? You're not sure what Paul said. Okay. We'll talk about it. Okay, here we go. The meat offered, where the two various opinions were very simple. No meat, veggies only. Or some said, the meat, it's still meat. The temple offering didn't change the molecular structure of the meat. It wasn't spiritually tainted. Their, their argument is, when it came around the backside of the temple, the meat wasn't possessed that all of a sudden, you know, it stood up on its haunches and started wiggling around. And if you eat that meat, you're going to eat it and digest a demon. And by the way, were, were they making demon sacrifices when they, were, when they were worshiping Apollos and others? Yes, that's his point in the, part of that, in the previous chapter. He says that things that were given to idols, you're worshiping demons. And so some of the believers were very fearful that maybe they would get tainted by eating the meat. And just uh, opening up the door, Paul is of the conclusion of the latter of these two. Paul says the meat hasn't changed. Yeah. And so when you go someplace and the meat is put in front of you, what does he advise them to do? What did he, what did he say? Don't, Don't even ask. Don't open up Pandora's box, is where he concludes. But the point is, we're, we're backing up a little bit further. Okay, the meat is okay or it's not okay. And Paul in this passage is going to say, the meat is bad, and you probably shouldn't do it yeah, you know, and don't eat it if, and he gives the reasons, like in verse 5, okay? And then he says it again in verse 23, when you jump down. What is the occasion where he says, don't eat? If you eat it, it's wrong. Okay, no, in those two verses alone. In verse 5 and 23. What's that? If you doubt. If you struggle with should I or shouldn't I, then what? Then don't do it. Okay, that's the first one. You don't eat it. It's wrong for you to eat if you, if you are struggling with this yet. What's the second one? Somebody mentioned it, but I want to keep you in order here. Verse 15, what's the second? Don't eat it if... 
If, it's gonna, if somebody sitting there with you is going to be stumbled and they're going to go, oh, then I'm going to go back to the temple. Then you don't eat the meat. Okay? So we bring this to modern day application. Okay? And is TV a sinful object to have in your home? You're not sure. Okay. Is it sinful to watch the Super Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> and, and right away, right away, we're going to say, if, okay, could it be wrong for me to watch the Super Bowl? If, what's that? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good point. Yeah, if it starts controlling me and I can't control and I get all upset, I'm not getting upset about this Super Bowl at all. Okay. okay. If, if it was controlling me and I did, it, it led me to wrong actions, I shouldn't be watching it. Is there any other possibilities? Okay, if I have somebody else in my, in my presence and I invite them over and they, they have, their idol is sports, we don't want to call sports an idol. But can it be somebody's idol? Okay, so I have them over and it's not like they're going to bow down before it and bring an offering. You know, I'm going to offer you my tacos uh, as they're watching the game. We don't mean it that way, but they... They're controlled by the sport. Okay, and so if, if I'm going to stumble that person, right, then it becomes wrong for me. But in and of itself, is it neutral? Is TV neutral? Yes, it's how we, what we do with it. It's, it's, it's the argument that we have in America that, that's very similar. Are guns the killer... Or are they the neutral object? Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. But it's being presented as they're the evil thing. Then what do you do if somebody runs down with a car or takes a knife and it's just at no limit? But this, this is a discussion that's happening in the church. And they're saying, okay, I've got to be very careful what I do because now I want you to look and see how, if somebody can, somebody flip over to 1 Corinthians, hold your finger, we're coming right back. 1 Corinthians 8 uses a term that indicates this whole discussion. That's very important we understand this term. Where he says, but take heed lest by any means this blank becomes a stumbling block. And he's arguing, again, Paul's arguing with the Corinthians, saying you can't do it if it's causing somebody to stumble, to go into sin. What would you say? What's the word there? Your liberty. Your liberty. And so in that text, he calls it the liberty of yours. What's that imply to you as a believer? You have, you have free will? Good. What else? What's another, another parallel to liberty? You have choices. Freedom of choice. Yes? Okay, you can choose certain things. And he says certain things you have no choice about. You don't say, well, I'm choosing gay lifestyle or not gay lifestyle. It is always wrong. I'm choosing whether to lie or not. I have the choice. The answer is, no, it's wrong. I have the choice of whether I want to be nice or not. No, we're supposed to be nice. Okay, so we have the right and wrongs. He is saying some things are not always right and wrong. They're gray. They're gray at times. And you have to make choices. And so he's allowing that. But the problem is, is when people make choices that are different from mine, if I'm pharisaical... I condemn them because they don't see eyeball to eyeball with me. I condemn them because they don't have a tuft. I'm using a really silly thing. But bringing it into modern day application where it really happens, I condemn them because they do it different. I'll give you one that's going to happen today. I may very well get a note in the mailbox stuck in there like I did last year. 
Your church is slipping from the truth because you didn't have church on Super Bowl evening. Okay. Do we have liberty as a church whether we have service or not tonight? But because we don't, does that make us heretics? Okay. Now, we're going to say that no because we're not going to condemn ourselves on this one. Okay. But can people, can we set up such standards that are not specified in the Word of God and say, you didn't wear a tie this morning, or you got a goofy tie, or you're wearing red, you don't have a sport coat on. Ladies, you're in slacks. Do those things ever happen in churches? Yes. Is there liberty within the church? Yes. Okay. We need to talk about it. I'm out of time. Oh, I, I knew I was going to get in the middle of this, and then I'm, yeah, 